Hi folks, well, at last here we are. We're about to hear from Professor Tim Noakes. For me, uh, one of the giants, if not the giant, maybe God in this field, this lifestyle that I'm passionate about. You all know that and you know how much I, I appreciate him. Just before I introduce him, um, some of the stuff about him, I counted them, he has 37 letters after his name. How cool is that? Not many people have that. Um, he's published, listen to this, 750 books and articles, scientific books and articles. Over 19,000 references are cited about him in the scientific literature. That's just amazing. He is a prolific author. He's authored uh, books on his love for sport, particularly running, and his passion for the low-carb, high-fat lifestyle. You know, I could go on and on and on. You can read from the, the CV. This is an extraordinary human being we're about to speak to. And as I've said to you all before, whilst I had heard about the whole thing about keto and I'd read about it, totally counterintuitive to everything I was brought up with, to risk yourself to go and shift, um, especially at my age, um, it was this man's voice. It was this man's voice. Just listen to it. It's uh, extraordinary. So, Professor, welcome. Welcome to our, our little show. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for that lovely invitation. It's a great privilege to be here and hopefully we'll be able to share some wisdom and change people's lives. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can. So do you want to tell us something about your, your story? Because your story is one of the extraordinary stories anywhere. You know, there have been films made of it already, but I guess there'll be more <laughs> on the road. Um, it's very special and it'd be wonderful for people to hear it. Sure, Jack. So. It's really interesting because when I left matric, uh, my high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea whatsoever. And I was fortunate to go to America for a year as an exchange student. And whilst I was there, Professor Christian Barnard performed the world's first human heart transplant I remember in it. my town and in the University of Cape Town. And yeah. I woke up one morning three months later in March 1968, and I said, I want to study medicine. And that was it. And so when I came back to South Africa, I enrolled, and uh, that was, if I hadn't, if he had not done that operation, I would not have become a medical doctor. I have no idea what I would have done, but I wouldn't have been a doctor. So that was the first thing. The second thing that happened was, in 1968, the Olympic Games were held at altitude for the first time. Yeah. And they, most of the scientists had no clue what the effect of altitude was on human performance. They just assumed it would be fine. So the athletes went and competed and there were some catastrophic events, some perhaps near deaths. Wow. But the, the point was that there was no knowledge about this critical event. As a consequence of that, and the fact that the East Germans competed for the first time in those Olympic Games, the world suddenly changed, and particularly the United States said, hold it, the East Germans are suddenly competing with us. We've got to beat them. How are we going to do that? Well, let's go the scientific route. And so science took off all over the world. The sports sciences took off the world, all over the world. And it was just the year that I went to the medical school, 1969. So I was so fortunate that here we had this field that was burgeoning yeah. and I was just becoming educated as a, as a medical student. So I went into medical school and one of the first things I did was I started competing in endurance sports. I started rowing. And the key moment there was that one day to our little group in Cape Town, miles away from Europe and the centers of rowing, the Olympic coach for the British Olympic team came to Cape Town. He was invited and he gave a lecture and I can still see him giving the lecture. Yeah. And he went up to the blackboard and he drew an, an, a Y axis and an X axis. And on the X axis, he has distance road, north, thousand two thousand meters and on the y-axis was the blood lactate concentration yeah and then he drew this curve and he said this is what happens your your blood lactate level goes shooting up and that's why you feel so tired and i thought you mean you can measure these things and explain <laughs> why you feel like you feel yeah and anyway so when i walked out the lecture and walked down the avenue at the university i said that's it that's what i'm going to do i'm going to study sports science wow. and it was literally those two events that that caused me to study sports science and the next year i went into physiology and anatomy and i was meant to learn medical physiology 
I just didn't. I taught myself sports physiology. And in my whole medical education, I was always studying the sports side of whatever was being taught. I was studying the sports side of it. And so when I graduated, I only graduated because I managed to fool the examiners that I actually knew something about medicine because I hadn't a clue how to treat anything and I still don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so that was because I had all these other interests and I was never interested in pharmacotherapy and so on. So having done that, then I went and did my internship and I realized that medicine was really not for me. I don't, I don't have a, a photographic memory where you can just look at a book and then you know everything. I, I like, prefer to write the book rather than learn it in that way. And so after doing my internship, I said, no, I'm, I'm a scientist. And I went into science and I started in cardiac physiology and did my PhD in cardiac physiology. And then the universities came to me and said, well, why don't you start sports science? Because that's clearly your, your love. So in 1981, we started sports science in, in my university and perhaps to some extent in South Africa. And I followed that route and did lots of research and you described some of the, the outputs that we had. But eventually my ill health caught up with me. I put on weight, although I was running marathons and ultra marathons, I was getting slower and putting on weight. And then all of a sudden I realized that, well, I should say I saw Eric Westman's book. I read Eric Westman's book, The New Atkins for the New You. And I realized that I was probably insulin resistant. Within a few days, I realized I was seriously insulin resistant and pre-diabetic or diabetic. And I chose to go on his diet and that changed my life because in six weeks I reversed this terrible state I was in and started living again as, as you've experienced and as everyone does experience when they go on the start. Yeah. And so after about three years, I realized I'd have to write something and I started acknowledging that I'd followed the diet. And that was the end because that cut me off from my profession and my university because they were not prepared to accept that what I was saying might be true. And so I was essentially kicked out of the university. I was kicked out of my profession and I was charged with um, Malcon, with, with acting in, inappropriately for a medical doctor, yeah. which was quite astonishing because I just answered a small tweet and the, the, it was ridiculous. The lady said that should, if she eats cauliflower, does she give birth to her child? <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> So I answered it and that, uh, that then caused me to be in court for four years. Wow. And it cost millions to the country and quite a lot to me. Yeah. But in the end, we won the case and we proved that the low carb diet is healthy and it is, con it is conventional, it's evidence-based. We presented over 12 days of testimony, myself and my three expert witnesses, presented 6,000 pages of scientific documents wow. compared to the one document that the opposition brought to prove that the low carb diet was dangerous. They brought one study which didn't prove anything. And so, so in the end, it was an amazing experience. I got very close to the, the head lawyer, Dr. Rocky Ramdas, and we just became brothers. And so for all the hardship, there were many benefits from going through it. But in the end, we won. We proved that the diet works, it's safe, and it can be prescribed. And so that, in a sense, is something of a landmark study. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, you've just summed that up in a few minutes, but it was four years. It was um, having heard you lots of times talk about it and the, the kind of madness of the establishment's arguments against you and the stuff they got up to, and then you're finding the scientific support to prove them wrong. I mean, it's, it's quite, quite a story, really. There's a lot to it, yeah? Yeah, and so we, so anyone who's interested, we, we did write the book and uh, it's called Law of Nutrition or in Britain, it's a real food on trial. And I really did that with Marika Spora. She's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Yeah. I did it to keep myself sane because I had this time and I thought, you know, I'm going to document everything these people do to me so that for the future, people will know what these people got up to. And these were colleagues and it's just they acted so unethically and so awfully. It was a public humiliation and that was the goal. 
and unfortunately the, the goal was to to shut me up and to take me off Twitter and to make sure that no one ever heard my opinion again yeah. or conversely any other doctor's opinion who was promoting the low carb diet that was the goal yeah. the goal wasn't to make people healthier and happier and disease resistant it was purely to to shut down debate on the low carb diet yeah but in the end all it did was it opened it to to everyone and it made it a cause celeb for the rest of the world and so it really backfired spectacularly on those people yeah and i mean it's very i, I know this from my own experience it's very difficult to blow your own trumpet right but i mean let me see if i can help a little bit i mean from what i can gather you were in the best university in the whole of the continent, probably in the world for your specialism, you were the top scientist at the university. And, and what seemed to happen, all, all because of a tweet, and the establishment, I'm going to use the word establishment, the establishment coming right down on you, friends, colleagues for years, suddenly turned their back on you. I mean, that must have been really tough to take. Yeah, it was. And, and you're quite right, because you, you actually got it completely right, as you've explained exactly what happened. Um, again, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but I was worth hundreds of millions of rands to the University of Cape Town in terms of a building. We got them a new building, which is probably worth 100 million rand now by itself. Yeah. We were bringing in 10 million rand a year for research funding. We were ranked in the top, th the, the university had three world-class facilities and we were one of them. Wow. And they could, they, and I was an A1 rated scientist, which is the highest rating you can get in South Africa. Yeah. And on the grounds of what four doctors decided, they decided on behalf of the university and the university wasn't strong enough to say, no, this is not right. And the answer was because pressure was being brought onto the university, in extreme pressure because of funding they they obviously there were funders out there who didn't like what i was saying yeah and they had to shut me up and there is an organization we're pretty sure that they were involved they yeah. go around the world making sure that everyone at the universities stays and says the same thing and they can't afford they couldn't afford as my son said they couldn't afford an a1 rated scientist to get up there and say listen this is wrong what you're doing this is the way it should be so they had to completely publicly humiliate me and it it was extremely tough and it really they actually started in 2012 the trial ran through till 2018 and eventually in 2018 june the 8th 2018 we won the case completely on appeal they appealed it and they lost and we won on 13 decisions against none so it was a 13 nil decision wow. and and i would have thought that the university of cape town would have had the courage to say okay we were wrong and we do accept that what you said was right. And we apologize for what you did. They did the opposite. I'm now, no, I'm, an, I'm a, called that individual. <laughs> when, when the university refers to me, they don't refer to me as Professor Noakes. I'm in their public dissertations, it's that individual. My so, God. and you just, you just wonder what's happened to, yeah. to science. And, and I really worry about, about science because it's, it's no longer independent and, and I just, that's what I learned. And so people have to realize that you've got to be very wary of the science that you accept. Yeah, and that, that probably brings us on to a great point here. Because you've got the scientific mind, you're <laughs> an A1 scientist, you've already had an interest in medical, the potential of becoming a doctor yourself. So you've got that type of brain as well. And here's a guy who is running marathons and yet becomes pre-diabetic or diabetic how on earth does that happen but when, when you find that out with your i'm going to you know people understand me, your big left brain type approach to the world yeah. and then you then you come across the atkins thing from eric westman dr eric westman and how do you deal how do you deal with that scientific mindset mm. with the counterintuitive stuff about going low carbon high fat how did you go through that journey because every people I know watching this and others who I've been pushing this for four years, yeah. it's not easy to hear. 
you know? You know, it was, again, it was one of those moments in my life. And I think I'm very decisive. I make decisions quite quickly. And I kind of, it's like an intuition that, yeah. that I just smell what's right. And generally, I've been, I've been correct. Obviously, there are times when I've done things wrong. But 90% but of the time, I've got it right. As Eric Westman's book was advertised on, on an email to me. And how did that ever enter my email? I have no idea. Oh, wow. But those were the days when people were advertising directly to your email account. Yes. And so it came and it opened it. And it, it, it was absolutely the right moment because the night before, I just finished writing the book called Waterlog. Yeah. And I just sent it to the publishers. And this had been a 30-year exposition of trying to prove that the industry was misleading the public about how much you should drink during exercise. Right. And I'd been castigated and, and to some extent thrown out of the profession in, in America. The American College of Sports Medicine made sure that I became a non-entity because I was saying stuff that conflicted with their funders. So when I let, I, I let the book, uh, send it off the night before, and in the middle of the night, I woke up and said, you've got to wake up in the morning and run six Ks and you've got to keep running for the rest of your life. And I went and did that six Ks and it was the worst run I'd had for months. Wow. And I literally came very feeling dreadful. And I came in and I opened my emails and what do I see? The new Atkins for the new year, but it said lose six pounds in six weeks without hunger. Yeah. And that I said, no, this is, this is false. And the, the irony was that I got so angry with Eric Westman, who <laughs> I knew was a great scientist because I'd, I knew Finney, I knew Finney had done the first low, low carb diet study. Yeah. And I'll, I'll go even go further than that because I'll tell you this is even funnier because when he did the study, one of the first persons who phoned me about it was a lady called Paula Newby Fraser, who was a triathlete. She was just becoming to the fore in the United States. And I'd helped her and she phoned me from California and she said, Tim, I've just read the story by Steve Finney about high fat diets. Do you think I should increase my fat intake? Notice she said, should I increase my fat intake? She didn't say, should I go low carbs? So I said, Paula, I think that's a great idea. You know, that's only going to help. But I didn't say she should cut the carbs. I just said, yes, eat more fat. Yeah. Which she did. And then she became the greatest triathlete of all time. She won nine Hawaiian, I'm sorry, yeah, nine Hawaiian, so yeah, was it nine? I think it was eight or nine Hawaiian Ironman triathlons. It's, it's unbelievable. And she won 28 Iron Men. Wow. And, and she's from Zimbabwe. And I knew her because she'd been in South Africa. And when she came to visit in Cape Town, she told me, Tim, you know, the best piece of advice I ever received in my life. I said, no, Paula, it's when you told me to go low carbs. Because <laughs> 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 I never told anyone to go low carbs. I told them to go high carbs. But, but I just told her, you know, she could eat more fat. And she, she did go low carbs and she was the most successful triathlete on record. So that was, that was a funny story. So you see, I knew, I knew Steve Finney and then he writes this book and he, made, he adds Atkins' name. Yeah. And I got so angry, I went straight and bought the book and I came back and I sat down and after two hours, I said, oh my gosh, I got it wrong for 33 years. I'm going to have to change. Wow. So I stopped eating carbs at that time. And by lunchtime, that was at my last carbs. And within two days, I started feeling better. In six weeks, I was running 20 years younger. I couldn't believe it. My running just took off. Wow. And so then I said, it's a miracle. And, that's, and I haven't looked back since then. It was, it was just astonishing. You know, I suddenly realized I've got an indirect connection to you. Um, I had the privilege of working with Liz McColgan. Mm. between her 10,000 meter silver medal at the Seoul Olympics and her yes. winning the World Championships in Tokyo at working with her mindset. Um, so I got a bit of a feel for long distance runners. And then she went on to win the New York Marathon. Um, I remember that. So I got so a little bit of a connection there. But, but tell us a little bit about, I mean, there's two journeys I really would like you to share if we've got time, would be just the whole low carb, high fat thing in relation to sports science, what you've been able to get out of various athletes. I know you talk about that, but also um, 
the, your whole passion for the diet that's pushed at um, the people in South Africa and the trouble that's caused for your health service and for people's lives. So these, yeah. these are two areas that would be great to hear a wee bit, a bit about as well. Sure. So let, let's start on the second one first. Yeah. Um, when the Nguni tribes people came into Southern Africa about a thousand years ago, in my view, they were pastoralists and they had a lot of cattle and probably goats and they weren't sustained by high cereal diets. That's pretty sure because they weren't growing much cereals. And there would have been enormous amount of game available. They, they talk about these day-long uh, migrations of the wildebeest and the springbok. Yeah. You just couldn't see animals. So it must have been very easy to pick off animals' meat in those days. It yeah. must can't have been difficult. No. And people think, well, now if you go to South Africa, you don't see that much game except in the reserves. So therefore, no one was eating much meat. I completely disagree. Yeah. So I think that if you go back and look at the traditional food of the Africans who now populate Southern Africa, it would have had a high protein and a high fat diet. Yeah. Now, South Africa was opened up and industrialized in the, in the 1880s by the discovery of gold and diamonds, particularly gold in the, in the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Yeah. The problem was that there was sudden this influx of people to mine and there was no food. So they first started importing maize from Lesotho and then the Lesotho farmers realized actually if they went and worked on the mines, they'd earn more money. So yeah. the production went of, of maize in Lesotho went down. And the South African government by this time had got quite a lot of taxation from, from the mining industry, said, well, let's just grow our own wheat, so maize, I apologize. And yeah. so they started growing maize in, in this abundant uh, the maize belt in Southern Africa, in South Africa. Yeah. And then that became the staple food. And so the staple food of South Africans today is maize. Yeah. But for, for the indigenous population, I don't ever believe that maize was the indigenous food. Mm -hmm. I think it was meat yeah. and, and meat from, from cattle, but meat also from animals. And when you have a population that's lived on a high protein, high fat diet for a long time, and then you expose them to, to maize, you're going to get a beastie diabetes epidemic in epidemic proportions. And that's what we have in South Africa. Yeah. So to me, it's very obvious that the diet is a key determinant of the ill health of the native South Africans. Yeah. And we have to change that diet. And that's the only way we can make South Africans healthy. Yeah. And you, and so that's my simple that. opinion. And what we do know now is that that type 2 diabetes is clearly directly related to high carbohydrate diets. Yeah. And it's reversed by diabetes, uh, sorry, by diets which contain less than 25 grams of carbohydrate. Yeah. So, so we know what the cause of diabetes is. It's a high carbohydrate diet sustained for a long time in people with insulin resistance. We know the cause. We'd have to go and work on reversing the cause. And the problem is that 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 maize is such a dominant food in this country that it's extremely difficult to to change that yeah but you have made some inroads in that haven't you yes we you know we're a tiny tiny little organization my foundation yeah and we've certainly shown that it is possible to eat a banting diet or a low carbohydrate diet for a pound or two a day and and that's and that's it can be an extremely healthy diet and we just wish that there was more investment in healthy foods like eggs and dairy and fish those are the sorts of cheaper foods yeah. particularly tinned fish you know if you were to subsidize those foods in a real way yeah and then it would be possible to to get people off the high sugar high carb high cereal grain diets and yeah. and once they do it they start to look so much more healthy yeah and i, I get frustrated when i walk through hospitals in south africa and you see the waiting rooms of people who are waiting for their medicines and you just see that this is a metabolic problem it's a nutritional problem it's not going to be helped by by drugs and pharmaceutical agents no no and um i mean the thing of course is that one would imagine there's a resistance again to the idea of 
people being educated into what's actually going on and uh, getting to make the shift towards the, the high fat and the low carb lifestyle. But it, but it must be happening in, the, in places. I, I'm sure you're, I, I heard you say before, you, 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 have, you have been getting results and people are, people are reversing out of those, those situations. Yes, indeed. So, so when we wrote the book, The Real Meal Revolution, which was really one that sparked the revolution in South Africa and, and ultimately was the reason why I was charged, because that book threatened to challenge dietetics in this country. Yeah. And the dietitians, because they're not trained to, to think of counter arguments, they, the profession is not built on counter argument. It's this is the way it is. Yeah. And you just accept that and do it. Yeah. And we don't, we don't have a debate. Yeah. It's remarkable. It's the only profession where you're not allowed to question and propose an alternate hypothesis or theory. So that was what happened. But the, the end result of that was that a lady who read the book, she realized there was one weakness that it didn't have a seven day meal plan. And so she started putting together seven day meal plans and she put them on the, on her Facebook page. So it became the Banting seven day meal plan Facebook page. Wow. And today, which she started five years ago, she has 2 million people, wow. mainly South Africans on this diet. Fantastic. So that gives you an idea how the diet has, has exploded throughout this country and why, why we were such a threat to the dietetics associations. So yes, there has been huge, there has been huge benefit, but, it would be very nice if someone in, a, in an official position would say, it's okay, it's okay to eat the low carb banting diet, it will make you healthier. Yeah. And if you're diabetic, it should be the standard of care. Yeah, but this is the issue all around the world in every country, isn't it? Getting them to admit this. We're getting there slowly, but... but um, so congratulations on <laughs> the impact of... of, of page in your book whatever it was that happened in, in reading that book for that lady to just um you know realize she had to do something it's fantastic it's very funny because she says you know the americans at facebook phone her and say how can you have two million followers what did you do she said it's simple i just cared for those two million people yeah yeah she said that's i care for everyone and we treat them with respect yeah. and it doesn't matter how fat they are and how much weight they lost they're unique human beings and we're going to support them yeah, and that's why it's been so successful. I mean, I think the magical thing about the low carb and the um, keto thing is most people, I believe, certainly my reason, come in for their health. Mm. They, they're not necessarily coming to sort of get really thin and look fit. No, I mean, certainly people do, of course they do. But I think the vast majority are in it for their health. And what I find, even just this morning, listening to Jimmy Moore, who you've been on, you know, yes. just listen to his podcast today, um, I mean, almost, it's, it's frightening how many diseases and health challenges are affected by the um, mainstream way of eating that we've been pushed at for 50 years or whatever. And as soon as, you know, as you said, in a matter of days, a week, four weeks, six weeks, people get massive improvements in all kinds of diseases. I mean, that must also thrill you, does it not? Yeah, absolutely, it does. And, and as you, you made the point, we, I estimate that 85% of chronic disease, the chronic diseases that we see in hospitals, the obesity, the diabetes, the hypertension, probably the cancers, the dementias, yeah. and a whole range of other things are all linked to, to dietary problems. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm always reading, but Richard McCarnas, Dr. McCarnas, an, an English physician, wrote a book called Eat Fat and Grow Slim. Yeah. But he wrote another book which has completely escaped. And it's called, it's, it's not in your mind. It's not all in your mind. Right. And he talks about food allergies. Yeah. And I've never read about food allergies. And he talks about some American guys who describe these food allergies. And he said, the problem when you change, the benefit of changing your diet is actually many of you get Many of us get rid of food allergies. And I had noticed that. I mean, I had all these allergies and they disappeared. Yeah. And, and I, that's another reason why you feel so good because you just take all these allergic foods out of your diet yeah. and you start to feel better. And I think that's an, a thing that we've underestimated. 
we yeah. say, oh, your glucose comes under control and your insulin's better and so on. But there may well be that many of the foods that are making us feel sick are just, they're causing an allergic response. And once we take them out, yeah. we feel immediately better. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, I mean, you'll know this, but people will talk to you and say, oh, you know, Dr. Noakes, I followed your diet. It went really well. And then I just decided to take a week. And within a week, I was so sick again. I said, I realized I can't go back on the old diet. Yeah. I have to stick on your diet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there, um, there was a, I mean, I was watching the other day an American football player on the, oh, that's right. He was on the team that the Kansas City Chiefs who won the, the, the World Cup or whatever, whatever yeah. they call it, the yeah. Super Bowl. And he's just gone, he's just gone carnival. Yeah. And he said, oh, you know, he was doing it very well. And then he went away for a week somewhere. And he said, you know, what will a week do? I'll just eat. Or well, normally he said, I was so sick at the end of that week that I just realized the con it's carnivore or nothing for him. Wow. But again, there, there's a component that I think maybe we've just, we've missed a little bit. And we, it's a pity because we need to, to advertise it more. The reason why you begin to feel so good is yeah. because you've got rid of all the allergic stuff out of your diet. Yeah. I mean, here's a question for you. It just occurs to me. Um, anybody watching this and the, the, the 37 letters after your name, and I joked about that, but the point is you're a highly intelligent man, an academic. Did you also, with that sharp brain of yours, experience brain fog when you were getting diagnosed with diabetes? You know, I've thought of that. And no, I, okay, so I used to fall asleep. That's what my wife would tell you. And if I would go driving, if we had, let's say we had to drive 200 miles, yeah. I would have to stop halfway and have a sleep, and then we could go again. Wow. So I, I, it, I did have the brain fog, but it would, would come in the form that I would want to sleep. Yeah. And I would sleep, and then it would clear. Yeah. So that's how I would recognize it. But I mean, now it's quite different. I can drive any distance, and I don't get... I don't get sleepy. Well, well I, didn't, I would fall asleep in lectures, and that's classically oh, yeah. for, for diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. So apart from the apart from the sleeping thing, when you became fat adapted, for want of an interesting phrase, did you notice an increase in the clarity of your thinking? Like we all do, or were you already just too far up there? Been I, no, I definitely think I did. And and you know, I'm 71 now, so I've been on the diet for 10 years. Clarity of thinking is still is still very good, so I'm very happy about that. Yeah. So I think that uh, it has. You see, what you have to compare with is what if I hadn't done it. Yeah. And then I think we'd have two different people talking to you. Yes. One would be 120 kilograms heavy. Yeah. On insulin. Yeah. And with completely uncontrolled glucose, probably with some peripheral vascular disease, maybe a stroke. Compare that to I'm um, 20, 30, 40 kilograms lighter, and I'm I'm able, able to maintain quite well. Yeah. So I think, and that that would be the difference. The yeah, that's fantastic. I, I was just on the cusp of really deteriorating. Yeah, and and given a year or two more, then things would have started changing for the worse. And, and the point, of course, is that you had no idea you're on the road to diabetes because yeah. you were the perfectly fit guy running marathons. Yeah, no, that's exactly work? right. And the people and watching I thought, I thought my father, you know, got the disease because he was a bit overweight. Yeah. And he did smoke in the past and he didn't do any physical activity. So I did everything right. So why yeah. should I get it? And of course, in the end, I realized that when I went back and looked at my data from some experiments we did on, on me in the 1970s, late 1970s, I was profoundly insulin resistant. I had a fasting insulin of 30 units in, in the units we use. And we like it to be at six, that's what I say is normal. Yeah. I was at 30, so I was five times the resting insulin. Yeah. And during the day, it, it so happened we measured insulin for 24 hours. And my insulin was still elevated by the end of the day. So I was just, I was cooking for hyperinsulinemia and, and profound insulin resistance. And I'm actually very surprised <laughs> that I got away with, with what I got away with. I shouldn't have. I should have had some of the complications of diabetes in my 50s. Yeah. But I kind of got through it. Maybe, that, maybe the running helped a little bit. And, and, uh, but, but of course, it couldn't stop the, the damage that was done. Yeah. And of course, the whole diabetes or the insulin resistance thing is a slow journey over many years, decades, before you maybe get the, we, the diagnosis. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, the sports stuff you're proud of? Because th there's a whole thing going on there that's really fascinating. Have we stopped? Hello. What are we doing? You back? No. <laughs> no, we just lost the internet connection. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. These things happen. Uh, thank God I've got you back, though, because we just got to the good bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so I, I was, I was, um, yeah, I, I was be quite good to get a bit of time because time will, will run out. These things fly by, all that I find, but especially with yourself here. And I don't want to interrupt too much so people can get as much of your voice as possible. But the thing is, um, tell us some of the stuff you've done in sport, though, with this, because that's really fascinating as well and a bit counterintuitive. So we're referring to, to diets. Is that yeah, you like to, to talk about the, diets? The, yeah. the running and the sport and what you've been able to do with that? Yeah. So, so my, I'm best known for two things in sport. One is the showing that people can overdrink and that you can get into real trouble if you overdrink because we're told to drink ahead of thirst. Yeah. And that's a killer. For some people who have a condition called inappropriate ADH secretion, they can retain the water and as a consequence, their brain swells and they die. Wow. And that happens in marathon runners and it's still happening even though we described the first case in 1981. So, so that was the one. But the other bit was the, 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 the fact that the brain controls exercise performance. And uh, yeah. in a sense, to some extent, what you believe is what the outcome is. Yeah. And although we thought that your legs tire and you run out of glycogen and produce too much lactic acid in the end it's the brain that's there to make sure you get to the finish safely yeah. and if you didn't have a brain you we would kill ourselves and we don't because we have the brain yeah and so that the the key to training is well obviously you want guys who've got the and women who've got the best possible physiology but in yeah. the end what distinguishes between the top the top group they're all physiologically pretty much identical. It's, it's the mind that determines everything. And yeah. a lot of people get it wrong. That doesn't mean to say you can take me with my poor physiology and make me a world champion just by thinking. That's not going to happen. No. But amongst the top athletes, the, the mind becomes the differentiator. And I, it's, it's, it's very improbable that, that the physiology can, can explain the differences when you come down to milliseconds, those, those are choices and decisions that the athletes make a third of the way through the, yeah, the finish line. That's when you make those decisions about who's going to win. Yeah. So I think that was the, the other, but then my, that was kind of the end of my career, but as, and I lost all my funding. So I would have done many more different things had I had the opportunity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but we've certainly done some low carb studies. And uh, we, we have published a paper last year showing, which, which is completely under-recognized, undervalued because it's a negative finding. So we've, we took a group and randomized control trial, which is what you have to do. And we put them, the guys, for time, for one period, they were eating a high fat diet. The other period, they were eating a high carbohydrate diet. And then they raced over 5K. So they were on the diets for six weeks each yeah. with a washout between. So it was a three-month study at least. And guess what? We found no detrimental effects of the high fat diet, even in people running at, at 84, 85% of their maximum. Wow. And, and that, that's really important because it, it shows that for the vast majority of athletes, the vast majority, eating a high fat diet is not going to impair your short term performance over up to five Ks. And, and no one will tell you that that a high fat diet is going to impair your performance in the ultra marathons because that's when you need all that fat. So, yeah. So we thought that we kind of proved that we've closed the gap. 88% of people who, who would run slower than the runners we tested, they're not going to benefit by eating a high carbohydrate diet. They're only going to not benefit because if they're insulin resistant, they're going to likely get type 2 diabetes with time. 
Yeah. So therefore, for for eighty eight percent of the people, we say, don't bother with the high carbohydrate diet. You don't need it. Eat something different and worry about your health. Yeah. That doesn't exclude the top twelve percent, and I suspect that there are athletes over very short distances, mile, two miles, maybe five k's, who probably do need carbohydrates. But again, I don't think they need carbohydrates in any near the amounts that they're using them. So. To answer your question, one of the studies we did, we looked at how much carbohydrate people burned of the carbohydrate that they were eating yep. during exercise and how much during rest. And it turns out that as soon as you eat a lot of carbohydrate, you burn a huge amount of carbohydrate at rest. So, but why would you need to? Because you should be burning fat. Yep. So there's an oversupply of carbohydrate. Once you get above 200 grams, for most athletes, that's way in excess of the carbohydrate you need. And you're going to be expending a lot of time burning off that carbohydrate when you could be burning off fat yeah that's the first thing the second thing we we didn't quite get to the final story but it was very clear that when you have fat adapted athletes and you give them carbohydrates they treat them completely differently than if you're a high carb diet and you eat carbohydrates so if you're a high fat diet and you eat lots of carb oh lost you again okay guys um hopefully you've still got me i'm sh assuming you have and um we'll just wait to see if he can kick back in again there we go oh maybe he'll come back now um hope he does there we go <laughs> sorry we missed you. <laughs> now, how much did you get of that? Did you remember? We just got up to the bit about um, they didn't they perform diff they didn't yeah they performed differently with having the carbs. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll pick that up. Yeah. So there's some work that that we were doing which we haven't yet completed, which seems to suggest that if you have a carbohydrate athlete and you give them lots of carbohydrate, they respond differently. They get a high glucose, high insulin response because they've got to get rid of the carbs because there's nowhere for it to go. It's, the body's already full of carbs. Yeah. But if you're eating a high fat diet, it's quite different. And it seems to us that you take, in, if you do eat extra carbohydrates, it doesn't cause the same metabolic chaos that, that a high carbohydrate does in someone who's a high carbohydrate eater. Yeah. You just seem to assimilate the carbohydrate with much less stress to the system. Wow. So that, that's really important, really interesting, because it may mean that a lot of what we think about about carbohydrates being so toxic for people who are eating high carbohydrate diets. If yeah. you're not eating carbohydrates and you simply want to fill up your muscle glycogen stores and your liver, it might be completely safe for you to take a reasonable carbohydrate load. And, and most of the athletes that, that we've spoken to or worked with who are at world class, they will tell you that they do eat more carbohydrates before major competitions. Yeah. So I think there is a role for carbohydrates in the shorter distance events, rugby matches, for example, soccer games, yeah. and that they, they can do quite well be, by taking in extra carbohydrate before competition. Once you get to longer distances, again, some of the athletes find that they do need to take carbohydrate during the races. But it's a trivial amount to compare with what they used to eat. Yeah. One of the athletes we help, he set a South African record, he did take 50 grams of carbohydrate for eight hours. So he did drink, he did eat 400 grams of carbohydrate during the race. But when you think of that, that's pretty trivial because most people are eating 56, sorry, 500 or 600 grams of carbohydrate a day competing at that level. Yeah. And here for one day, he ate 400 grams. Yeah. So to me, that, that's fine. That's not going to yeah. have a huge metabolic effect, which is harmful. Yeah. However, have, have, by comparison, has anyone tested someone just on fat only uh, to compare with these guys who have the little carb load up? No, they haven't. And oh. that's, so we don't that's know. the problem. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's so difficult to do these clinical trials. You know, Louise Burke from the Australian Institute of Sport has tried to do them, but she couldn't do randomized trials because you can't tell athletes they were preparing for major competitions. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't tell them that they have to follow this diet or no. 
you couldn't give them the option. They, they chose what they wanted to follow. And so that rather influenced the outcomes. And we can't really assess, although her study showed that a three-week tr- program of a high-fat diet seemed to impair performance a little bit, yeah. the, 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 the very likelihood is that that was an, had a brain effect, an emotional effect, because these were people early in this ad- adaptation. And as you know, and we all know, you only start adapting to this diet after many months and starting to understand the nuances of how to perform best. Yeah. So I, I wonder if there'll ever be a, a six month trial of the diet. Instead, we just have to go with the anecdotes and yeah. the anecdotes tell me that lots of people benefit hugely from this diet and they do very well left to their own devices. And some of them eat a little bit more carbs and some eat no, none or very little and some eat a, a little bit. Yeah, I've got some anecdotal experience myself of working with um, professional football at soccer clubs here in the UK, national rugby squad, Scotland. Um, And I find by doing muscle testing, kinesiology, that when, for example, I tested footballers, professional footballers with, um, you know, Gatorade or Glucosode or whatever, whatever one it was, these power drink things for athletes, Mm. The bodies would always feed back that it was that it was toxic, but I but I never got the chance to do it like like at half time, mm. so that I could test. Okay, is is it like what you're suggesting? A little bit of carb at that point would be okay. I never got the chance to do that, but certainly you know in the training area and in dressing rooms, testing one or two of them to find out it was always always um, toxic. You know, the feedback was toxic. Yeah, that's really interesting because yeah. that, that can't be a placebo because no. every athlete believes that carbs make you better. So I t- I tell you, so another you would one. expect them to outperform uh, I, I, compared to doing something else. I, I, I tell you another one. I found that wearing artificial fiber, especially around the thymus gland, for athletes and footballers, if I tested them, they would have no strength either. And I, and I suggested to Liz McCaughan, way back before the Barcelona Olympics, she went there injured, but nevertheless, I was still working with her up to that, a little bit at that point. And I suggested that she got a piece of cotton, just, just a, maybe a three inch square, and get it sewn into a Lycra you know, running uh, uniform for, for, for Great Britain, so that it would protect the thymus. And I believe she would, get, she would have got an extra few yards or whatever. She didn't do it, um, but the girl who beat her, and she just didn't do well in that, that uh, 10,000 meters, primarily because of an injury to her knee. Mm. But the girl who won it, uh, for, I think from Ethiopia, ran away with it, and she was wearing a white cotton t-shirt underneath her Lycra top. So it's an interesting anecdotal story, but I could go on and on, but it's not my story issue today. So um, <laughs> let, let me ask you then, if you don't mind, because time is flying. Um, we got into this because of the COVID thing. And I, I suspect yeah. people would be interested in what's your belief around or what are you doing yourself to maximize? I mean, because you're in the age group, you know. Um, what are you doing to maximize your ability to withstand it? Should it ever show up, you know, delete that program. But if it ever sure. shows up, how are you going to, what, what are you doing? What do you, what's your belief? Well, I mean, the evidence is clear that insulin resistance is one of the key drivers of risk of, yeah. having a fatal COVID outcome. And, I, and no one can hide that. No. Even my country where we censor a lot of stuff about medicine yeah. in this COVID era, they're saying that diabetes in the Western Cape where I live is the biggest risk factor. Something like 50% of the fatalities are type 2 diabetic. Yeah. So people are finally having to admit it. And so I did an interview, which is actually on YouTube. People can watch it. Yeah. And the guy asked me that question. He said, uh, you know, you've been saying this for 10 years. What do you think it tells us? And I, I predicted 10 years ago that the, the diabetes tsunami is coming. And, yeah. and now, finally, we've seen the consequences of it. Yeah. This is one of the worst consequences is that you're at risk of, of developing a fatal outcome. So, but people didn't take any notice. And, but when I wrote those books 10 years ago, we didn't know what that diabetes is reversible. Now we do. Yeah. So essentially no one has an excuse at, in the, at the high level. Yeah. They don't have an excuse not to say, listen, people, if you want to be healthy, 
you must reduce your, your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And you do that by eating a decent, fat, fatty, high-protein diet. But, but no one says it. Not no. one person yeah. has the courage to say it. They do, they'll say, oh, diabetes is a problem. Yeah. And then they'll say they're comorbidities. And we say there's not. There's one comorbidity, and that's insulin resistance. Yeah. So, so what do I do? Well, I, I have locked down because being 71, I don't want to expose myself to any more risk than I have to. Yeah. So I've been very cautious, but I mean, that in fact is just following what the Southern guidelines are. Yeah. And I've been making sure that I'm eating this diet and I've, I do take quite a few vitamins and mineral supplements. And so I've made sure that my vitamin D intake is high and I've taken occasional vitamin C, but, but, I focused on vitamin D as I think that I would guess my values are high and, and I'll get out in the sun as often as I can. So yesterday I spent an hour gardening in the sun to make sure that my D levels are higher. Okay. But, I, but more than that, there's not much more I can do, I don't think. Do, do, do you protect your skin when you're out gardening? No, not at all. I, and that's really interesting. I'm, maybe you're leading to this. I yeah. used to have what's called English skin. I mean, that, yeah. that's what I understood it. Yeah, and when I went in the hot, hot African sun, I would just go red and peel, yep. and I would never tan. Now yep. I tan, yep. and the only thing I've done is, of course, go on this diet and cut out the polyunsaturated fats. So I think that the the polyunsaturated fats set up this inflammatory response. Yeah, and that's what sunburn is. But I don't get sunburned anymore. I just tan. It's it's yep. it's like I've got a different skin. That's astonishing, and a lot of people notice it. <laughs> and and but you know, again you're not allowed to mention that because that's anecdote. But for myself, I no longer worry about my skin protecting my skin. I actually I will actively underdress when I go out in the sun. But I, I, yes, it's an anecdote. But I, it's one that we hear over and over and over and over and over and over yeah. and over again in countries like South Africa, Australia, the, you know, California. People are finding this if they're on the the low carb keto thing that they're. they're Exposure to sun is completely different. They, their experience. So this is, this is cool. Oh, I've lost you again. Oh my goodness! Just when we're about to get towards the, the end. Hopefully you'll come. Oh, you're still there. Yeah, I'm back again now. <laughs> anyway, to move on. Um, to move on. What one of my my brand is called Mind Store. Okay, that's ah, about the mind. So Ray yeah. talked about that. You've talked about you know the. the, the the elite athletes, it's all about the mind as opposed to everything else, because you can take everything else for granted. So um, one of the things that started to occur to me, um, I was doing, I was in my late 50s doing a, one of my courses in Dublin, and there was a guy that was 65 at the time, and he was talking to me at the break, and he was mentioning, like, as soon as you become 60, you become invisible. This was his theory. Yeah. People don't notice you any longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in society, and he was very upset about it. And he was talking about, you know, that maybe you, sh me, talking to me, maybe you should start running programs for people who are going to live long, especially the baby boomers, and what, what's going on. And, and I, since then, I've been thinking about it a lot. And so I created a concept in my mind called Mind Store Centurions. And the simple idea is that we live to 100, fully healthy, fit mentally, physically spiritually everything aligned so we're feeling really great and blah 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 and ideally the, i suppose the dream would be to just pass away quietly in your sleep or something yep now what are you doing for your longevity and what do you think the role is for this low carb high fat thing in relation to longevity where's your thoughts with that yeah i i just think if you're not eating low carbs you, you're going to tire by 80 and you you can't expect to live much beyond 80 and I know for many people that that probably is fantastic, but yeah. I agree with you. That's that's only the beginning. <laughs> so what I'm <laughs> <laughs> so my goal is also to get well beyond eighty. Yeah, and uh, there's no reason not to get into the nineties, and so that's my goal. And I quite agree with you. You know, one of the things that I learned from my father's death was that that we have a responsibility to our family not to put them through the duress of a long illness. No. And diabetes, that's what it is. It's, it's a four-year disaster when the, when the patient is completely immobilized but still alive. 
but not really alive. And so I don't think we can afford that. And so my goal also is to die in my sleep, yeah. having never taken a serious medication. I do take metformin for my diabetes, but I don't consider that a, a serious medication. Okay. So the goal is to, to die in your sleep without ever having taken serious medication and hopefully to get beyond the 90s and maybe into the 100s. So, and you know, again, it's you know, what you believe determines what you believe. And yeah. if you're continually thinking you're going to die at 80, well, that's what's going to happen because you're going to start slowing down and you're not going to do what you should be doing. You know, with the lockdown, it's been really interesting. I haven't been able to go to gym. And I've, I, literally, I could feel myself aging in this, in this six, sorry, my cell phone is trying to answer something. And I can feel myself slowing down. I've gone back to gym now, one session, and I'm back feeling great again. Fantastic. And I, I can't imagine trying to live beyond 70 without doing gym twice a week. I, it just, you can't do it because you just get fixed. Your body just gets fixed. Yeah. So you, you have to do hard, and I do hard exercise at the gym. Yeah. And, and then I continue to run. And I think those are, the di that without the diet, you won't get anywhere. But without the exercise, you don't maximize the benefits of the diet. Yeah. So you have to do both. And then you have to keep working and have a goal every day. And yeah. Get up with a reason. And I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to solve issues, try to continue to solve these, the medical issues that we face and try to write more and to know better my so topic more better. And, you know, I look at it as this, I'm retired. I've got all this time and I've got, answer, I've got questions that I wasn't able to answer in my career. So what, what's a better time than now? <laughs> so, and I, I'm just I really enjoying, enjoying life and let's hope it just keeps going that way for a couple more decades. Yeah, I mean, it feels like we're coming to a natural end, but maybe people would want me to ask you this, and I hope you don't mind. What, what would sure. be a typical day of eating for you? You know, what, what, are, you, what are you kind of eating? What's a... What, what, what are you doing? That would, that would be really nice. And then you can tell us how people can find you. And then obviously we'll, we'll encourage people to donate when this goes up next week. Sure. So it's very, my diet's very simple. It's like yours. I eat only five or six foods, fish, dairy, meat, eggs, nuts, and some vegetables. That's it. What, what point one and point two is I eat one that? meal a day. Sorry. I, I meet one. I, Thing got frozen there. Um, I eat one cooked meal a day, and then I might might snack on cheese and biltong. That's the South African jerky. Yep. And nuts, and and that's it. And so it's very simple. And in the meals, I eat as much as I want. So if I'm going to have eggs, I'll have four or five or six eggs. I won't have one or two. No. And if I'm eating a steak, I might eat two. And, and that way I've got this long fasting period, which I think is critically important for yes. management of diabetes. So I try to eat within a, in a constrained time of the day, maybe eight, eight hours and then not eat yeah. for 16 well, hours. Well, and that, it's taken me time to get there. I didn't, couldn't do that when I first started the diet. Yeah. I was still eating probably three meals a day and then eventually went to two meals a day. And now it's down to one meal a day. I, I couldn't, I would get full very quickly if I tried to eat twice a day. So that, that's it. So there's only six foods. And then I just, I just change them around. I eat oh. fish two or three times a, a week, yeah. steak two or three yeah. times a week, eggs yeah. most days. Same as me. What, about, what, what veggies are you having, just out of interest? You know, almost nothing. I mean, the only ones I might eat are squash and a uh, tiny bit of lettuce. Um, Creamed, creamed spinach, which is a favorite of mine. Yeah. And, and that's about it. Wow. So you ask why, and the answer is that, that we think that you must eat vegetables for the antioxidants to prevent your cholesterol from oxidizing. Well, the best way to prevent your cholesterol oxidizing is to be ketotic. That's, that's very clear. There's a lovely paper just out from Jeff Volek showing that yeah. if you're in ketosis, your, your antioxidants are flowing but they they human antioxidants that's the key plants produce antioxidants to protect plants not to protect humans oh, yeah. that, that they that's what they use we need to produce our own antioxidants and you clearly do that by eating a high fat 
low carbohydrate diet. So, do you ever drink tea or coffee and or the occasional alcohol? Do you have a glass of wine? Yeah, I eat plenty. I drink tea and coffee all day. Wow. I, I'm a teetotaler. I just okay. alcohol never really agreed to me, but agreed with me. But I, I drank it because it was socially acceptable. Yes, and I yeah. thought I had to be socially acceptable. But I think about six years ago, I said that's it. Okay. Because also I don't want the extra carbohydrate or the extra ethanol. No. And I think ethanol is a toxin. Yeah. And so, you know, once you, the key is getting to 80s is, is, is quite a lot of people get to 80. But to get beyond 85, 86 and to still be lucid, yeah. that's more difficult. And I wonder if your lucidity starts to fail if you've been a, a drinker. And, and I mean, a gentle drinker. I don't think no, no, no. you have to drink too much to damage yourself. Over 60, 70, 80 years. That, that's the key. And, and finally, what about cream? Do you have cream? I have cream in coffee all the time. I don't drink milk anymore. Okay. I, I mean, I'm a milk. If I had, I've got the only two things that I could potentially be addicted to now are milk and peanuts. And if I go near peanuts, I'm in trouble. So I just don't. <laughs> I've eaten probably one handful in the last two years. Okay. But, but milk's the same. I could easily drink a litre of milk. Well, not a litre, but 500 ml, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so I can't afford to drink it because it's so full of carbohydrates. And so I drink cream. And the interesting thing about cream is that I find it so sweet. <laughs> you know, people say, I, I've realised you've got to get rid of the sweet taste. That's the key. Yeah to this diet you may not have anything sweet yeah and if you do that you you'll you'll never relapse on the diet you'll be fine yeah. yeah but even just continue to eat something that tastes slightly sweet you're in trouble and then you know i eat or i eat lemons now when we eat a lemon and we squeeze it on our on our fish i eat the lemon now i would never have considered that i couldn't have done it no. 10 years ago but now i could easily eat a lemon without any problem and drink lemon juice Wow. But I won't, I obviously won't drink orange juice. No, no, no. Um, like, I, I'd want to keep you here for hours. I don't, I can't obviously, but so one other question then, my final question. Um, what advice would you give someone who is watching this? Um, who's, especially from me, heard so many references to all sorts of disease. You said 85% of disease, yeah. you know, you, you reverse out of sort of thing or the causes, the carbs, and so on. What advice would you give to someone who's thinking about it, but maybe needs a nudge to get started? What would you say to them? Yeah, it's very simple. And the answer is, you don't have to make a commitment. Just make it a two-week commitment. Just try it for two weeks and see what happens. And most people will start to notice within two weeks that they're feeling better. Yeah. Uh, don't ask for a year-long commitment. So let's just start with a two-week commitment and see what happens. And if they get through that two weeks and they're feeling better, then they carry on. I would encourage them to stay six weeks because that's when my life turned in six weeks. It just, yeah. it was, uh, I mean, I can still remember the moment when I was running down the mountain and I just suddenly, it was like someone shot me with a shotgun. I just went, poof. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'd been running for an hour already. Yeah. Before I couldn't run an hour full time yeah. when I was really sick. And, yeah. and I just took off. And I, Where did that come from? <laughs> and that was it. And I was, I was just, I did an interview with another guy in Australia a few hours ago. And he's been on the diet for four years. And he said he just gets this amazing feeling like he's in heaven. It just comes right up. And he says, it has to be coming from the brain. Yeah. And he said, I would never change back again. No. So if you're an athlete and you, you're thinking about it, just try it. And it might be tough for a week, but sooner or later, you're going to feel better. And, and listen to the people who've done it and who've benefited hugely. I mean, the, the only people who are not going to benefit probably are the ones who are so insulin sensitive that they can afford to eat carbs. Yeah. One, of, one of the great South African runners is, is one such person. I mean, I've known one person in my whole experience who's eaten the massive carbs and at the age of 70 looks amazing and runs faster than anyone else. And he says, you know, I never followed your diet. And I said, yeah, you didn't need to. And it's embarrassing that you've done so well, but you know, the rest of us, we just, we're mortals. We had to, we had to change our diets. 
Well, you know what, um, Professor, I don't think you're mortal, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> absolutely extraordinary, man. And, and, and you've blessed us with your time. We're, I'm so grateful. I know everyone is going to be over the moon about this. Uh, I'll send you uh, next week, I'll send copies of the um, comments from the Facebook, because it goes out on Facebook first, then I go to my YouTube channel and I'll send a link. And then we'll, I'll encourage everyone to donate so we can help the foundation do its work. Um, but listen, thanks for giving your time. I'm ever so grateful. Uh, you're, you're a big star for me. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. It's been a lovely interview. Thank you so much. You know, I love where we can have this nice chat and where I trust the person. Yeah. And, but that's with the low carb people, you can trust them because, you know, they've gone through hell to get to where they are. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we've all been through it in different ways. And so we, and we're naturally attracted to everyone because we, we're yeah. all a bit maverick. Uh, we yep. all have stood up against tyrannies <laughs> yes. and it's, and we, we share so much together. So thank you for sharing me with your audience. Thank you. And, and thank you for all you do for your audience. It's just a privilege to be able to, to help in this, this great event and what we're achieving. That's very kind of you, Professor. Well, have a wonderful day, what's left of it, and continue doing whatever you're doing because it's working, it's powerful, it's, and the time is right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, so, Jack. Thank you. Thank you.